Thank you very much, Madam, for this kind introduction. Honorable Minister of HRD, Sri Kapil Sibal. Honorable Minister of State, Madam Purandeshwari. One of the distinguished sons of India, Dr. Pachori. A very distinguished scientist and a close friend of mine, Professor Rajshekaran Pillai. Dr. Markham, the ever energetic and smiling Dr. Debal Kar, and ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here. First of all, before I start saying something, I must apologize that my voice cracked a little bit on the way to this uh, conference. And my apologies, and I'll try to minimize my talk as much as I could. First of all, I wanted to congratulate Terry and Dr. Debalkar and Dr. Pachori for organizing this conference in a grandiose manner and to showcase the great achievements of India. Today, we had a review of the Digital Library of India project, spearheaded by the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology. We have put more than about 150 million pages of information. Now, more than about 70% of it is already available on a 24 by 7 basis on the web. We've been adding more than about 50 to 60 million pages, making it to be one of the world's biggest digital libraries. And sometime back, when the Minister for HRD, Sri Arjun Singh Ji, went to Saudi Arabia, I had the honor of accompanying him as the Associate Director of the Indian Institute of Science. At the time, on a hard disk, we gave the, I mean, uh, the Saudi Arabian government 6,000 books of Indian origin in Urdu and Arabic. They were thrilled. That was a hard disk. Now, we are going to have a Tamil conference in Chennai in June the Ministry of Information and Communication Technology is planning to give 4,000 Tamil books in a small pen drive that will be given to the delegates. And in about 10 years' time, the same pen drive will hold not 4,000 books, it will hold 4 million books because the capacity would have expanded by about 1,000 times in 10 years. So if you take the case of a person from the time he's born till the time he dies if he keeps reading the books, Maximum number of books that he can read is about 10,000. So probably, you know, he could keep all of the generations of knowledge on a pen drive about 10 to 20 years from now, and all of us would be living to see this happen. If you see what are the kinds of hurdles that we are going to have in making this information absolutely broad-based, I think one of the greatest things that's going to be a big hurdle is the copyright. Where else can I, you know, uh, pour out my lament except in a place where the country's most distinguished and leading lawyer is at the uh, table here and he knows about the copyright laws more than I do. I'm not here to sell the ice to an Eskimo, but at the same time bring out the lament from the point of view of our users. If you take a typical library in any place, only 10% of the books are within copyright. 20 to 30 percent of the books are out of copyright, and seven, 60 to 70 percent of the books are now what are they known? What are known as orphan books. The origin of this copyright is not known. The person who has written it is not known, and you know quite a large number of these things are actually you know they're sitting there as a large dog in the manger. Most importantly, out of the books in I mean in copyright. 90% of the books are out of print. If the books were written to spread knowledge, I think these archaic ideas of you know, copyright laws must be re-looked at in the new, in new paradigm. For example, you know, there is a way by which you could look at all of these books could be actually books which are called the orphan books could be digitized and put on the public domain. And we could pay the, pub I mean, if we could identify the publisher, we could pay him based on the access like what UK has done. And more still, what's going to happen is many of the people are actually coming ahead and saying that this is my grandfather wrote the book, but he's no longer alive, but we are willing to give the copyright of these books to the public, I mean, Digital Library of India. So we've been having lots of donations of these copyrights coming in because there is no formal mechanism of receiving them. 
So if you look at the origin of the copyright law, the copyright law was introduced so that the crown could have a control on the publishers, publish, publications. It's very difficult to control every guy, author who is writing it. And also the cost of publication, the printing press and other things were very expensive. So there were very few compared to the number of authors. So they went ahead and put control on the publishing press rather than on the people who are writing the books. Now in a world where the publication cost is next to nothing, I could carry about four million books in my pocket. I think we need to have a relook at these laws. First to start with, the copyright law says after 60 years after the death of the author. Actually, it's a very sad incident to look for when the author died. <laughs> okay, we could have gone ahead and made the public law saying that n number of years from the date on which it was published. Because I am a scientist, I cannot look at a non-deterministic moving goal post as a target. That makes the life more miserable. The second thing is, we have a law in India which says if there is a book which is out of copyright in the United States, I am not permitted to scan it and give it. Okay, whom will you sue? Who will sue me if, I, if the book is out of copyright in the United States? It's not out of copyright in India because the author has not died there. <laughs> so I have a feeling today, if we have to spread knowledge, and particularly in a world where the cost of publication is zero, companies which cap I mean, uh, uh, give out software, more and more software free, capitalize more, not necessarily in terms of revenue. The only way by which we can repair the whole system and spread the knowledge is to sit down and write a digital copyright act. Sir, I don't know where else to go because I have seen you argue eloquently on every one of the issues. And I'm willing to you know, fall at your feet to seek your help in making sure that we scientists are able to <laughs> take the world by storm. Today, India is a repository of the largest amount of knowledge. If we do not go ahead and make this public, Google through its, you know, you, you must be familiar with the Google settlement. Google has a right to copy all of the books in India which are within copyright or without copyrights. <laughs> and they have the right to do that today because they are following the American system where now the orphan books, these, which are called the orphan books, can be copied and disseminated. There is also a fair use doctrine. We can actually go ahead and repair that in the light of you know, digital copying. For example, even the Digital Library Lending Right Act can be repaired to some extent because libraries are meant to loan books. I can actually go ahead and loan digital books without having to pay royalties on them. Make sure I can put a technology by which at any given time not more than two guys or three guys can access it. So we can come up with any technological solution that you need I can stand before you on behalf of my community of information scientists and academic institutions that we will find a technology solution as long as there is a societal solution available. It's a great pleasure and honor being here. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the voice. Thank you.